Hello, it's Manveen here. Today's episode is the first in a new six-part series presented by my colleague at the Sunday Times, Emily Dugan. Emily has been investigating the case of Andy Malkinson, a man who was convicted of rape in Greater Manchester in 2004, but still insists he's completely innocent. This is part one of 17 Years, The Andrew Malkinson Story. Before we begin, just a warning. Some listeners may find some of what you're about to hear distressing. Also, there's some strong language. Nice to see you anyway. I've come to meet Andrew Malkinson, or Andy as I now know him. He's showing me his room in the bedsit in Grimsby, where he's been living since he was released from prison last year, after spending 17 years behind bars. This is my tiny room. Andy's 55, and he went to jail when he was 38 for a crime he insists he didn't commit. I spend most of my day sat in front of my laptop. I'm sitting opposite him. Yeah. It's cramped. In one corner, there's a small table with his laptop on. In the other, there's a shower and toilet with no door. I'm perched on the end of his bed, which takes up most of the other space, and he's sitting on his desk chair his knees not far from mine. So, I've only got a little cafeteria, so I'll have to juggle it. Bit, but... Andy's wearing grey cargo trousers and a well-worn jumper. His hair is short and dark, greying at the sides, and he wears small wire glasses. I find he's got a gentle and kind manner about him. At the moment, he's not working. He gets by on universal credit of around £750 a month. Andy's struggled to find work, Having spent 17 years in prison, all he can think about is getting his conviction overturned and clearing his name. In 2004, Andy was sentenced to life in jail after a mother of two was raped by a stranger and left for dead by a motorway embankment in Greater Manchester. But Andy says he never left home on the night of the attack and that he's completely innocent. You're listening to 17 Years, The Andrew Malkinson Story, a podcast brought to you by The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Emily Dugan, a reporter at The Sunday Times. This is a series about how one man spent almost two decades in jail for a crime he says he didn't commit. Despite trying repeatedly to clear his name, he remains a convicted sex offender. But now, we've uncovered new evidence which casts doubt on the verdict and the criminal justice process. In this series, I'm going to investigate what might have led to a potential miscarriage of justice in Andy's case. Because there are things that just don't add up. And if he has been wrongly convicted, Why is it so hard in this country to clear your name? I'll look at how when Andy was sent to prison, he was expected to spend around six and a half years inside. But because he continued to protest his innocence, that became 17. It's a way of getting those who are wrongly convicted to make a false confession. I'll look at how those who knew him best have never believed it. The crime didn't fit Andy at all. He had been uh, nice to people. How the rape left a whole community in shock. There was true fear. I mean, it was horrific. I'll ask questions about the police and our justice system and try to figure out why things might have gone wrong for Andy. One of the really strange things about Andy's case is how he becomes a suspect. I'll speak to people who were key to the case and find out if all was as it seems. They said that they would send a warrant for our arrest if we didn't um, act as witnesses. And... If Andy wasn't the rapist, who was? This is part one. Life turned upside down. Last year, while he was still in jail, Andy wrote me a letter. Dear Emily, first of all, thank you for listening. The crimes for which I am wrongly convicted could hardly be more emotive. So I appreciate you taking the time to hear the evidence. As a journalist, lots of people come to me with stories but Andy's caught my attention. 
On the 19th and 20th of July 2003, I was working at the Ellesmere Shopping Centre as a security guard. Nothing untoward happened. I walked the half a mile or so to work and back, spent most of the day patrolling and looking for shoplifters. By the time the shift ended, I just wanted to sit down in front of the telly with a couple of cans and sleep, which is what I did. The letter Andy's reading is actually a response, as I'd written to him during the pandemic. I've spent a lot of the last decade investigating failures in Britain's legal system. It's often trumpeted as the envy of the world, but it's not always as great as we like to think. I've met many people whose lives have been destroyed by its flaws. Not everyone receives fair and equal treatment under the law, even though it's sort of what you expect, or at least hope. On the 2nd of August, the police knocked on my door. I answered and they told me they were arresting me for attempted murder and rape. I was completely shocked and obviously had no idea what they were talking about. I often see cases where one or two things have gone wrong in the path to a conviction. But straight away, Andy's case leapt out because it seemed to tick every box for how our justice system can fall short. So that's why I got really interested when I read Andy's letter. Over time I learned what had happened. It was utterly nightmarish, and as time passed, it got worse. At first, I thought it would be cleared up quickly. I never imagined I'd be mistakenly identified by the complainant. But when I was, I felt the floor was open. I felt I was not getting much legal help. I felt in my gut I was being set up. I have struggled to read some of my handwriting. I apologise. As I said, please feel free to ask any further questions you would like. Send him best wishes, and once again, thank you. Your sincerely, A. Malkinson. In July 2003, Andy was living in Salford in Greater Manchester. One hot summer's day, in the early hours of the morning, a brutal and violent rape occurred. A mother of two was dragged into the bushes by a motorway embankment while she was walking home. She begged for her life before the stranger raped her and left her for dead. She didn't know who the attacker was. But Andy soon became the prime suspect. And then the victim picked him out of an ID parade. Andy went to court and was found guilty of two counts of rape. And, in 2004, began a life sentence. You want a coffee or a, a juice? I've got some cranberry juice. A coffee, like, a coffee would be lovely, but no coffee. rush. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. I, the kitchen, I want to know more about the crime and the circumstances that led Andy to being convicted. But first, I need to get a better sense of who Andy is. So earlier this year, just a few months after he'd left prison, we sat down, with a coffee in hand, at his bedsit and started at the beginning. I was born in Grimsby here in 1966, January. Grimsby's a port town in the county of Lincolnshire in the north of England. It's by the North Sea on the east coast. In the mid 1950s, it laid claim to being the biggest fishing port in the whole world. But in recent times, it's been a victim of industrial decline. In 1966, the year Andy was born, England won the Football World Cup. Bobby Moore receives the trophy, the golden symbol of international supremacy. I think it's good. The Beatles top the charts. We'll just be the same people as we've always been. And in March that year, Harold Wilson was elected as Prime Minister of a Labour government for the second time. My mum worked in a local factory, I think it was... um, biscuit factory or food factory. My stepfather worked in the textile factory. And did you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have a half brother, a half sister in England. And I latterly found out how two half sisters in Australia. And what was your childhood like? My childhood was quite happy. I remember being outdoors a lot. And um, I remember the summer of 76, I was about 10. I went as brown as a nut. And, and the summer seemed to last forever. It was just a very happy, innocent time, you know. I remember, I remember it fondly, being a child. He never caused me, you know, he never got into trouble when he was younger. He was just a quiet young man and a quiet baby. That's Trisha, Andy's mum. 
I first spoke to her on the phone in December last year, just before Andy was released from prison. For this day for, for a long time. Yeah, 17 years. Um... But now she's nipped over to the bedsit and we're looking through some childhood photos of her son. He's leaning against a fence in a little uh, kind of short dungarees and I'd say he's, I don't know, he's two or three there. Yeah, he's about two and a half. It, that was in a, when we lived in a flat. That was in the back garden there. He's got a very cheeky smile there. And his blonde hair, yeah. It was always very photogenic. As a child, one of Andy's big interests was the night sky. He was fascinated by stars. Astronomy. Astronomy, yeah. I did get an astronomy book when I was very young. I was about seven or eight for Christmas. And I started going to the library and reading more and more about it because I just loved it. Did you enjoy school? Yeah, I did, actually. I used to like science subjects. I was quite good at chemistry and maths. In 1982, when he was 16, Andy left school and, like many young men from Grimsby, went to work at the local docks. It was hard work and, well, smelly, obviously. (laughs) Uh, And poorly paid, but as a 16-year-old, it just feels good to be earning money straight away, straight out of school. I just used to love working all week and then going out with my mates and getting drunk, just having fun. It was just going out into the world. Three years earlier, in 1979, Margaret Thatcher had become Conservative Prime Minister after pledging to slow inflation and curb the power of the trade unions. I know full well the responsibilities that await me as I enter the door of number 10. Her time in office would see major industrial decline across parts of the country. In early 1985, Thatcher's government got a decisive victory in the miners' strike. Yeah, we're going over to the newsroom for a report from Jan Leeming. The miners' strike is over. It was also the year that Andy, now 19 years old, started seeing a woman. Yeah, we got along really well and we had a happy few years and we had a child, my son, yeah. Andy's son was born in 1987 when Andy was 21 but the relationship between the parents didn't last. It was probably my fault. Um, I was drinking a little more than I should. Very sad. There's a few regrets I have there. Um, I couldn't really handle it anymore, sadly. I I didn't have the strength then that I have now, regrettably. Do you have any contact with your son now? Yeah, yeah. We're not as close as I would have liked to, to have been, but... He's a lovely bloke, you know, he's a lovely lad. He's grown up very well and he's got a a really good career as an engineer. But Andy hasn't had any recent contact with his son's mother. No, I've not been in touch since 30 years ago, so... Wow. Yeah, yeah, sadly. In 1991, and with the relationship very much over, Andy left the UK for Holland. He spent four years working and travelling... And by 1995, he was in the Hook of Holland, a small coastal town in the south of the country, with a direct ferry to Grimsby. Once there, he found a local job agency. It was, at the time anyway, quite easy to get work. Minimum wage, labouring work. And then you met someone? I did, yeah. Yeah, I met Karen. Karen was like um, like a kindred spirit. Yeah, we had a lot in common. We did everything together, I remember. And we, we called each other uh, soulmates as well. <laughs> Karen Schutmacher is Andy's former girlfriend. I spoke to her on a video call at her home in Holland. She's lean, with long, greying blonde hair, and she smiles a lot when we chat. Karen's been one of Andy's biggest supporters since he was first accused of rape and attempted murder. Anyway, back in 1995, she was also living and working in the Hook of Holland. And I was actually travelling with a backpack. I had a meeting with my employer in the restaurant. It's a sort of a bar. The guy that ran it was an old gruff Dutchman. Lots of agriculture type work in glass houses, that kind of thing. When I entered the restaurant, it was a totally empty restaurant, but there was only one person sitting there eating. And that was Andy. I think we looked at each other straight away and she sat right next to me. I just actually went to his table and said, well, is it okay? I sit down at your table. And we started chatting like we'd known each other for ages. Everything went really quick because I also had to look for a room and he was actually looking for another room. I think I was staying in someone's Dutch guy's attic. So we actually kind of started off like friends. 
I found a room and we shared it. To save costs, um, because we were getting along as well. And from the one till another, <laughs> we became closer as well. And that was that. Andy and Karen remember that room as a happy place. We were singing together uh, the song from Bob Marley. Like, is this love, is this love, is this love, is this love that I'm feeling? Yeah, yeah, we used to do soppy things like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is a memory that we both were singing that song because we were sharing this very tiny room with this single bed and this one mattress. It was almost impossible to live there. That sounds very romantic, actually. Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> During this time, they both worked night shifts and would find themselves by the sea in the afternoons, having slept during the day. You know you're not going to spend the rest of your life living like that, sort of a phase. It just felt very fresh and free and nice and just just felt good. Everybody would go to the bar in the weekend, so it was, yeah, it was very uh, kind of a holiday life in a way. For around five years... Andy and Karen had what I guess you'd call a slightly unconventional relationship. But then, as time moved on, so did they. I can't put my finger on why. We're both very independent people. That's probably got a lot to do with it. We remained friends even when we we stopped having a physical relationship. We remained friends to this day. The physical relationship is not so important. We have a very strong friendship. In 2001 after Andy and Karen's relationship fizzled out. He left Holland and went to Thailand, the island of Phuket, to be specific. By now, Andy was in his mid-thirties. He followed his usual pattern of looking for casual work to fund his love of travelling. When I go somewhere, I don't don't generally stay for a couple of weeks. I try and find a way to stay longer, you know, living on a shoestring, staying in cheap hostels, finding casual work. But his experience in Thailand was not a good one. Hello, I'm Emma Tucker, editor of the Sunday Times. It's thanks to listeners like you that we're able to provide journalism that matters. Get to the heart of the story every day with the Times and the Sunday Times. Subscribe today and enjoy one month free. Visit thetimes.co.uk forward slash stories of our times. When Andy arrived in Thailand, back in 2001, he said he met a couple of guys who pointed him in the direction of a man who might be able to find him work. They introduced me in a bar. I, I had all the impression that he was a businessman. He, looked, he gave that appearance and demeanour. So he said to me, we might have some work for you. I was like, oh, great. But they'd asked me for my passport. I didn't think much about because I thought, well, it's, it's my ID, isn't it? It's to prove... Who I'm, who I say I am. There was also a younger man with this supposed businessman. I, I gave him my passport and a photograph, and I thought, well, they're going to only only can have it for a day or so. But a few days passed, and nothing. I started getting suspicious. The young Thai lad was with him. At some point, he told me this guy was dangerous. So I thought, oh, fuck, what, what's happening now? I, I started saying. I don't want anything to do with drugs over here because it's death penalty and I'm definitely not doing anything like that. No, 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 it's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. I wanted to go to the embassy and say something, but I thought, you know, these these people are like gangsters or something. And I didn't know what to do. Then, when Andy finally got his passport back, he says they'd created a copy of it with a different name, but with Andy's photo. The same day, the police turned up. They came screeching up on mopeds and we were having a coffee outside the place we were staying, the, the hostel. They arrested us. And they said, oh, you've got two passports. And I went, I don't know. It was horrible. It was horrible. They, they took us down to the, to the monkey house, actually. They call it the monkey house. <laughs> oh, it, was, it was awful. It was crammed to the rafters, a huge holding cell. Um, I mean, it's stinking hot over there uh, and humid. Andy says an officer appeared to take some pity on him. He was really earnest. So I'm so sorry what happened to you. I know it's not you. We're watching these people. You will have to do a little bit of prison time, but I'll make sure it's a very small one because this is nothing to do with you. 
I went to a, a brief hearing. He said, hock dung, which I didn't know. I was like, what does that mean? And then he said, it means six months. So I thought, well, at least it's not six years, you know. Six months is a very long time to sort of accept as a prison sentence if, if you were just caught up in it. I mean, did you... I didn't accept it. I was, it, yeah. it was horrified. It was terrible. So Andy would spend six months in jail in Thailand. If you think what happened in Thailand was bad, the next chain of events would change Andy's life forever. After his sentence, he was deported back to Holland in late 2001, where he stayed for around a year and a half, at which point, in May 2003, Andy decided to head to the Canary Islands. I thought, cheap sun, it's guaranteed warm down there, and see if I can get a bit of work, you know. He headed to a hotel-type complex in a place called Los Cristianos, on the island of Gran Canaria. So I got off the bus and I booked in, paid a week in advance, and I, I sat by the bar. There, Andy met a British couple from Greater Manchester. This guy was waving and trying to gesticulate towards me. Cheap tattoos all over him, you know, a handmade one. Oh, no, no, no. He's English, I know, straight away. Coming up to me, he said, oh, where are you from? Are you, you're English, aren't you? Yeah. And, and um, he basically wouldn't leave me alone. He would not leave me alone. He said, I'm bored and I need, I need a bloke to talk to. I'm with a wife and kids and, and all that. And it seemed, you know, I thought, yeah, but pff, I, I don't want to. But Andy would make some kind of friendship, or I guess maybe acquaintance with this couple, whose names were John and Deborah Hardman. It was just a bit over-friendly, you know. I thought, I'll just um, humour them for a few days. I found some time for myself, I did, but it's hard to avoid them when you're in the same place. And they're, uh, shouting towards you all the time. And, you know, they're a pain in the ass. The Hardmans would soon leave, but not before they'd given him their phone number and details. I fully expected never to see him again. But Andy would see the Hardmans again. And the following year, they would all find themselves in court. A short time after the Hardmans left the Canaries, Andy says he was mugged. He'd been out drinking and says at some point he was targeted. With no money, he felt stranded. These people were still fresh in my mind. I called them. Yeah, they sent me 50 or 60 euros or something. I got a ticket. I went to the UK. He said, oh, you, you'll pay us back, won't you? I said, of course I will. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything like that. And that's how I ended up in the UK. And did you ever consider calling your mum or calling yeah. anyone else in Holland? Or I know, I know. I, I must have not been thinking straight because I was in a bit of despair. So... As Andy tells it, the Harbans bailed him out and paid for his flight back to the UK and he agreed to go and live with them in Salford, Greater Manchester, hoping to quickly pay off his debt. Grab a few weeks' work, give them their money back and then... Yeah. Which I almost did, but I got caught up in this. Now, the next sequence of events, we're going to go over in more detail in part two and throughout the series. But let's just pause for a moment. Right now, Andy's a man from Grimsby who grew up with a caring mother. He had a love of the night sky. He left school to work on the docks at 16. In his early 20s, he went travelling and also had a couple of failed relationships. He'd fathered a son, who he now regretted was distant from him. Andy did odd jobs here and there to get by and had, let's be honest, a pretty bad scrape with the law in Thailand. Although he's adamant he was a completely innocent party in that. What happened next changed his life beyond recognition. In July 2003, Andy, who's now 37, was working as a security guard at a shopping centre in Greater Manchester. By this point, Andy says he'd paid off his debt to the Hardmans. But one night when he was drunk, Andy fell asleep and urinated on their sofa. Unsurprisingly, things turned sour and Andy left the Hardmans and moved in with a colleague. The Hardmans wanted him to cover the cost. It was a beat-up old couch, like something second-hand you'd find or even uh, on somebody's front lawn. And I think they wanted something stupid. They wanted 800 quid or something stupid like that. I said, I'll give you 50 quid. That's it. That's... They started being threatening and aggressive. So Andy went to the police. I made a report. He tells us what's been happening. I said, yeah, they're threatening me for, for money and trying to intimidate me. Six days before this, a horrific and brutal rape had happened nearby. 
In the early hours of the 19th of July, a mother of two was attacked and beaten on her way home and left for dead. It was a huge shock to the local community. I could hear people talking about it. I thought, oh, no, I'm not massively surprised. This is a really rough area. I could, t- I could tell it was a rough area. Um, but, but it was right on the periphery of my awareness, you know. The country was experiencing a heat wave. On the day of the attack, Andy had been working. It was really incredibly warm, unusual for, for England. Nice, you know, I was loving it. I, I like that. So that evening then, you, you, you're pretty sure you'd, you'd finished work and then, and then what? By the time I'd finished walking back from the Ellesmere Centre after wearing stubproof vests and all the stuff I was wearing, I was exhausted. I had no wish to go out. I've got two cans on the way home. I'm tired, I'm hot, I want to shower. I just want to sit down and drink a couple of cans and watch TV. That's all it was. It was just an- another day. So you never left the house that night? No, definitely not. But two weeks later, in August 2003, Andy was arrested. About eight in the morning, bang, bang, bang. It's the police. Mm, OK. I open the door and they say, um, Mr Malkinson, yes, we're arresting you for attempted murder and rape. I was like, what? I was completely dumbfounded. I think my words were, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I didn't know what was going on. He was then picked out in a video lineup by the victim and a separate witness. The, the world um, just opened up and just a sense of doom, a sense of what the fuck is going on here, you know? You know, why he, why he identified me? And he stood trial at Manchester Crown Court the following year. And in February 2004, aged 38, was found guilty of rape. I was just dumbstruck. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe they convicted me. I couldn't believe I'd been accused. And then life sentence as well. What the fuck? So how does a man who says he's innocent of a crime this serious get convicted? How reliable was the evidence which brought the police to Andy's door? Next time on 17 Years, the Andrew Malkinson story. One of the really strange things about Andy's case, which has always stood out to me, is how he becomes a suspect. When Malkinson was led from the dock, I'll never forget the expression on his face. He had been uh, nice to people, respectful to women. The crime didn't fit Andy at all. You've been listening to part one of 17 Years, The Andrew Malkinson Story, with me, Emily Dugan. The series is brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times. It's written by me and Will Rowe. The series is produced by Will Rowe, with assistance from Brenna Dardolf. The executive producers are Poppy Damon and Lynn Jones, with original music and sound design by Tom Birchall. If you've been affected by any issues in this podcast, there are some helplines and websites you can access. Just go to the notes in the podcast description. And if you have any information that you want to share on Andy's case or remember anything from the time, you can contact me directly. My details are also in the description notes.